Henry, of course, is a master at arranging meetings at beautiful locations, having worked with Henry for almost 30 years. And some of the work, although, um, was inspired by conversations that Henry and I had and in context with uh, Rick Johnson and uh, the concerns about the chronic kidney disease and what the climate connection uh, was to that. And so I'm going to focus um, sort of on that story. Um, in some ways, I'm going to sort of apply uh, Lee Newman, who gave an excellent presentation yesterday morning, on the attribution aspects. But here you'll see it's from the climate angle. It's not going to be as rigorous. Um, but it'll, you'll see some similarities, Lee, and, and those that were here yesterday, to, to that approach in a way. Um, heat stress, um, we heard a phrase yesterday, which, which is actually a bit foreign to uh, the, the meteorology community, the world global, um, sorry, wet bulb global temperature. Um, heat stress is very analogous to that, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But it, it's nothing untowards that you're not familiar with, but I'll touch upon it in a moment. Um, inspired in part by the recent uh, sort of review paper, and it, it puts out a proposal, um, a hypothesis, Rick and his colleagues, um, commenting here that a common theme in the 2016 paper uh, that appeared in Blood Purification, a journal I don't usually read, so um, <clears throat> in fact, I would say I probably would, avo I would avoid this one at all costs, uh, for obvious reasons. <clears throat> um, so a common theme is that CKD is occurring in subjects working manually outside, uh, directly exposed to sunshine, and frequently they're in areas where there's significant water shortage or scarce access to, to clean water. And so the proposal was offered. And, it, and, and you know, in light of what we heard yesterday, we recognize this to be one of multiple factors. And we really would like to know what the role of this factor is uh, relative to other factors. So this isn't meant to be a, a univariate, uh, this is the factor. But we propose that Mesoamerican nephropathy is essentially a consequence of global warming, and maybe one of the first major diseases that are described as a consequence of extensive fossil fuel use and greenhouse effect. Um, John, um, John Patz was really kind to um, give me a copy, or at least loan it to me. I don't know if you gave it to me, if you loaned it to me. I, I should check to see what my, um, <clears throat> I haven't written it yet, actually, but it's now in a near mint condition, I should say that much. Um, <laughs> And I noticed that there was um, a call-out box in here uh, using the phrase climate canaries, which comes from a, a box that Dave uh, Wegman and, and um, Corolos wrote. And if I can just read this, because I think it's very much in the context of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, and we heard this yesterday, so it's a refresher. Many of the occupational hazards worsened by climate change are not new, but their um, increases in frequency, intensity, duration, and so forth. We saw some of that in what Balaji was talking about this morning. Um, workers, I mean, that's uh, Dave's point, uh, the takeaway I took from his talk, workers, people who really are constrained and they can't necessarily adapt because of various practices that come from above. So if they were making their own choice freely, they probably wouldn't be out in the heat of the day, but that's not their, their choices. So climate canaries, and, and, and Dave and Cora called out, already climate canaries include the more than 20,000 sugarcane workers in Central America who have died from chronic kidney disease due in part to extreme temperature. Now, they're not called climate change canaries. So actually, I think that's good, it, it, climate canaries. And I think um, that's the question whether these 20,000 or so deaths have been a consequence of just the exposure to the normal elements and other factors, or climate change is, is the uh, key factor. Um, what I know about CKD, until recently, I had learned by sleeping at the Holiday Inn Express. So um, I hope you'll excuse me if this all seems pretty uh, naive. Um, NPR did a piece two years ago, um, which is really a, a very good, nice public piece, um, which I went back and, and, and listened to and read. And so just a few highlights. Um, and, and some of these um, we heard already, of course, the form of kidney failure known as chronic kidney disease of the non-traditional origin or unknown you. Um, you For a reason is distinguished, but it doesn't matter. I see. OK. It's found from South America to Panama. It occurs. Um, it says you're only along the Pacific coast. Um, I heard otherwise, of course, yesterday, particularly among male sugarcane cutters. Uh, we just talked about that. A similar epidemic among Sri Lanka sugar farmers. We heard about that yesterday, which has a hot climate like Western Nicaragua in response to Sri Lanka government banned um, glyphosate. And so you would think, oh, they think the cause is related to that. Perhaps it is. Um, certainly that was the action that they took um, in response to the, an epidemic in that area. Um, just another piece of background. I mean, I was sort of st really stunned by this picture. 
uh, knowing the kinds of uh, weather elements and looking at the attire, I can't imagine that that would be the way we would even go outside in that area, let alone wearing what looks to be an, uh, heavily insulated. Because it's such a harsh environment, the, the sharpness of the reeds that are being cut here, the stalks, um, and so you really don't want to get yourself cut up, among other reasons that you are tired like this. It's a perennial grass, sugar cane is. Um, it likes high temperatures, so it has particular geography where it's going to thrive. Um, it needs to have a lot of water, not necessarily when you're cutting it, but before in the uh, growing season. So it likes a monsoon climate, which uh, is offered to the, this region very nicely in that there's a wet season followed by a dry season. The optimum temperature for um, stem cuttings is in the 32 to 38 degrees C range. Um, so those are, um, um, that's optimum. Um, it slows down at lower temperatures. And at higher temperatures, it virtually shuts down. So that's an interesting concept, because if that's true, this all becomes academic, as you'll see. Um, if the temperatures start going up into the 40 degrees C range, at least in this area, sugarcane is a non-issue in the future, presumably, uh, at least for the strains that are now being used, I should say it that way. Moisture and heat uh, favor growth. Uh, while dry, sunny periods and low night temperatures are favorable for maturation and sugar accumulation. That's when the harvest season happens. I was sort of also really struck by the, um, the time series, which is covering 1990 to uh, present, 2015, for the um, sugar cane production. Uh, this happens to be Brazil. I think it's probably fairly representative of other areas, which has increased fourfold, which tells me, you know, since this is such a manually intensive, but not entirely, it's increasingly having some mechanization coming into it. Um, but the exposure clearly is increasing. More people than ever are in fields harvesting this because there's a global demand for this product. And so that also has to be a consideration when thinking about causes. Um, just a little bit of background reading. Um, the three key points that I take away from the article by Vito Campisi, dehydration, heat stress, and exposure to agrochemicals. And that, that could mean a multitude of, um, of evils here. Um, <clears throat> This paper, another review paper that came out about the same time Rick's study came out, um, again, um, speaks to that this isn't new. There was a first international workshop, apparently, on Mesoamerican nephropathy about four years ago in Costa Rica. And that workshop at that time had established that the cause of, of, of um, Mesoamerican nephropathy remains uncertain. So that seems to be still true today. Um, however, the group suggested that repeated episodes of occupational heat stress and water solute loss in combination with exposure to nephrotoxic medication or exposure to inorganic arsenic, uh, words I can't pronounce, pesticides, might be responsible for this epidemic. Pretty much what I heard yesterday, so um, it's all good. So let me take us a little bit through the climate part, so that the things I know a little bit more about, but not a lot more, because frankly, I don't usually look at the climate of this very regional area of the world, um, Pacific Coast, of uh, Central America, so that's also new for me. Henry's more experienced on this, and so um, all the mistakes I will attribute to Henry, if I may use attribution causality in this case. Um, but this is also a little bit of a foreign territory for me personally. So the region that we're talking about um, is, is seen here from Mexico, actually the southern tip, all the way down to Panama. And we're interested in a coastal area where this crop is particularly harvested. I'm going to show you. Um, some data for um, an airport, um, Tapachula, uh, which is near um, sort of where sugarcane production is, is active. And so I'll go to that. So these are numbers that I think are very familiar to us. Just want to summarize. Uh, this is about based on 20 years of data. The elevation of the station is 500 feet. It, it, you quickly appreciate that there's really not much month to month variability. Climate is pretty stable. When I say climate, I should say that the seasonal cycle is very flat. So a warm season versus a, uh, is 89 degrees Fahrenheit for daytime high temperature, and a cold season to daytime high is 87. So you know, you'd hardly notice a two degree difference, frankly. Nighttime temperatures are typically in the mid-70s. Okay? So there's a diurnal temperature range. And that's actually interesting because it tells you that there could be mitigation of exposure, given the fact that the temperature from morning to, to afternoon varies by 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so there is a wet season. The wet season runs from about um, April or late April, or early May, I should say, to, to about October. That's when cloud cover is quite high. So the fraction of the sky covered by clouds on average is almost 80, 90 percent. Um, but it's in a dry season where the workers are really out there intensely for the most part, as I understand it. And so the cloud cover might be only on the order of about 30 percent. So 
it's mostly a sunny kind of a, a day, which is where this um, wet bowl global, global temperature becomes relevant because it weights the temperature that you actually uh, measure in what's called a black body. So it's what the um, exposure, so most temperatures we measure are in a enclosed screen as if it were a shaded environment, but the wet bowl global temperature also incorporates a weighting for the black body temperature, which is the exposed skin temperature at, on a sunny day. Um, relative humidity is very important in this story because this is where the heat stress really comes into play. So the um, relative humidity is a measure of how much water vapor is in the air compared to how much water vapor the air could hold if it were saturated. If it were saturated, this value would be at 100%, um, which it virtually um, is at nighttime. So this is the nighttime value. But during the daytime, the relative humidity um, is typically in the mid 50% during the harvest season. In the growing season, it's higher. Okay. Um, Sugarcane harvest season is November to April. I'm going to focus on that, but I'll make a contrast in a moment. What you're looking at is a climatology of those temperatures over a 20-year period or so from a station data. And there aren't many stations. This time series is not of the temperature, but it's of the number of stations that we have available to figure out what this map should look like. And, it, and I make the point that sparse station coverage right now, we estimate there may only be about eight stations that are available routinely. So, you know, we don't know as much as we'd like to know, especially at the scales at which workers may be operating and so forth. So that's an uncertainty. In, in, but we estimate that the temperatures in this coastal region at the high temperature time of day in the afternoon are typically um, in the uh, 30 to 32 degrees, so 85, 87 to 90 degrees or so. Okay. Heat stress, um, here's a simple table, and it's a very powerful table because it, it, it makes some very important points. So right now I mentioned that the air temperature during the harvest season, oops, sorry. I don't know why I quite did that. There we go. I must have pressed a button there. Um, is around 30. That means, uh, according to this table, um, which is applying a, a, a complicated formula. I won't go into the details of how the heat stress is calculated, um, but relative humidity, air temperature, and, and physiology of human perspiration all come into calculating this. Um, the air temperature and the um, heat index are virtually the same at the relative humidity of 55%. But if temperature goes up, even if the relative humidity doesn't change, the relative humidity increase, sorry, the heat index increases much more than does the temperature. It's this nonlinear effect. So we may say, oh, well, temperature's only going to go up three or four or five degrees. You can certainly live with that given the, the diurnal temperature range. But the heat index will increase by a factor of two or even three more because of that compounding effect of the body having to stress more to cool itself um, in such an environment. So that's an important consideration. All right. Um, Takeaway point, uh, I think you've seen it. I'm not going to dwell on it. We'll come back to this. Typical daytime temperatures um, in the uh, harvest season are in the low 30 degrees C range. Heat index is a slightly higher value than that currently, as best as we know. So how has the um, heat index changed? And this is key, because the period over which these 20,000 deaths have occurred, supposedly the causal factor is one causal factor is believed to be the change in temperature and heat index during this period. So what do the data have to say about that? So first off, I'm showing you here is a map of the change in temperature between two decades, the most recent decade ending in 2014, and an earlier decade in the 1980s. And this is temperature. And you can see, actually, the colors are virtually all the same in the red. Temperatures, sorry, this is the maximum heat index now, not the temperature, have increased more than 1 degree C during the growing season. But during the harvest season, when the workers are most exposed, the temperature increase factor is some areas in which the heat index has gone down. The heat index hasn't increased nearly to the extent it has in the growing season. So that's an important consideration when thinking about causality. Yes, it's warm, but the warming has mainly been at the time of year when the crop is growing, not when it's being harvested. And that's an important distinction, I think, in thinking about this as a causal factor. So just to summarize, Heat stress has probably risen by about a degree Celsius uh, throughout the year um, in recent decades. It's risen more, um, uh, it's risen less in the harvest season than the growing season. I'll say there's a modest rise in the Pacific Coast harvest season heat stress since 1980. Now, modest doesn't mean it's not important. I'm just saying the value is small, small when you see it in comparison to what's to come. So just to state this in a different way, daytime heat stress in Central America coast has risen. Um, more than one degree C in the growing season, less than one degree C in the harvest season. 
Um, my read of what these numbers would suggest is it's plausible that chronic kidney disease of this NP variety, um, the increase in the last 20 years has been more about climate and health rather than climate change and health. That's my read of the numbers at this point from the data we have. Now the open question is worker exposure during a growing season, how large is that? Okay. An ironic twist is that the increased sugarcane demand, partly to mitigate climate change effects and reduce fossil fuel burning, has likely increased human exposure and health risks in the sugarcane harvesting. It's one of these unforeseen factors that come into play here. I'm running out of time, five minutes, I think I'll be able to get to if you stop pestering me with that slide. Um, <laughs> So how is heat stress expected to change? And that's the last part, Allison, just teasing you. <laughs> um, so um, Jerry, next speaker after our break, is going to get into some of the modeling tools that are used. I think some of you already were showing IPCC images yesterday, so you're somewhat familiar. I'm going to be using a particular model from NCAR, a jury shop. It's a very sophisticated, uh, the latest uh, version of the climate modeling system that's run here in our own backyard, so to speak. It's a global model of the ocean, atmosphere, land system. It resolves scales of about 100 kilometers in spatial dimension. Um, not what we want for the problem at hand, but it's what we have for the problem that I'm going to share with you today. Um, uh, these models are driven with our best estimates of the way greenhouse gases and aerosols, anthropogenic aerosols, soot, solar activity, volcanic activity have changed in the last century, and then estimates of what we expect they'll do in the future using an aggressive emission scenario. The beauty of these experiments is that they get repeated uh, 40 times over the same record, driven the same way. It tells us something about the statistical robustness and the reproducibility of certain impacts. And so that's what I want to um, focus on by using three time slices from these experiments as a calibration period. I'm going to look at what the model tells us about the current climate and the near-term future, going out only a decade to two decades, and toward, it, toward the end of the 21st century. And so I'm just going to use a very simple graphic, which I kind of like. Um, Henry had shown a, a version of this earlier. Mine doesn't animate because Henry's more advanced. Um, but what you're looking at here is a, a, a time rose in which uh, the outer rim is one month of each month of the seasonal cycle. Here's January, February, March, April. March around here, that's a seasonal cycle. And then the, the radii um, plot the heat index. Um, and this is of the model. And this is the heat index value calculated from the model. After calibration, these models require calibration. This particular model has a cold bias. If I just took the heat index calculated from the model data, it would really serve us poorly. It would misrepresent actually what is likely to happen because its uh, cool bias understates how severe the heat index increase will be. So, so we calibrate for that. So what you're seeing here is, first of all, all of these rings, all of these are 40 members that I mentioned. They're almost on top of each other. In other words, for a 15-year average, each of these experiments says there's a unique climate, and that is not very variable from one sample to the other. And it's a climate in which the heat index is higher, further out in this bulge in the growing season, and the heat index is lower near 35 degrees C in the harvest season. Hey, that's good news. You know, you're going to be out in the field when it's not as bad as if when you were in the growing season. Somewhat good news. But how does this change? So the next increment, 2026 to 2035, and one thing to note is that there's no overlap between these rings. In other words, the world, as far as this area is concerned, is different. It's a world not experienced before. There's no single sample out of those 40 runs that looks anything like the magnitude of the heat stress experienced by people who are out in the field in the early part of the 21st century. So that's a very important um, recognition right now that the world changes as far as people who are exposed workers that are out. Most of the warming, though, you can see there's more displacement in the growing season and less displacement in the harvest season. I'll give you a number. Then if you go out to 2071 to 2080, we're only talking about a half century, so we're talking two generations of workers. It becomes completely un, uh, almost unbearable um, uh, during the harvest season. The heat index here is greater than 40 degrees Celsius. Um, that would be like 100 and Fahrenheit, and it gets as high as almost 50 degrees Celsius at the very end of the um, harvest season. In the growing season, the heat index is well beyond 50 degrees Celsius. That's not that far in the future. Another way to look at that is these distributions, which give you the frequency um, from the samples of 40, and it in indicates 
Thanks, Allison. Um, I'm comparing the temperature versus the heat index. And I just wanted to make this point. The heat index, the way it's calculated, is always a value larger than the actual temperature. So the perceived heat that the body is feeling is greater than the actual uh, daytime air temperature because of the moisture content. Then as you go out into the future, you can see how that separation even, I'm going to toggle. Air temperature rises by about 3 degrees. The heat index rises by about 8 degrees Celsius. Um, 8 degrees Celsius is something like, I don't know, Henry, 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. All right, just to wrap it up then. Um, takeaway points. Heat stress um, will increase much more than temperature in Central America. There's a nonlinear relationship between the heat stress and the temperature in, in climates that are hot and humid to begin with. I see it's shaking the head no. <laughs> um, I imagine it'll be a question coming. Um, heat stress in the harvest season um, is projected to increase uh, by two, degrees C, two to three degrees C just in the near term relative to current conditions. So that um, prolonged exposure becomes dangerous using the language that the Weather Service uses in their heat index. Heat stress um, in the harvest season is projected to increase um, by seven to nine degrees C in the uh, latter half of the century typical values of about 113 degrees Fahrenheit in March to April. So that would be an extreme danger for any prolonged exposure. Um, so just the last, very last slide. Um, the recent increases in heat stress, I'm summarizing where I've been here in this presentation, they've been small, less than one degree C. Um, I, would, I would propose that Mesoamerican nephropathy in the last several decades is unlikely due to global warming as a principal factor, as a principal factor. A mitigation of the warming effects to date appears to be pretty amenable to simple adjustments in the way the worker is exposed to the elements, if it is an issue. Um, but there's that caveat that maybe that's not an option. But an acceleration is expected in the heat stress rise over the next several decades, especially in the near term. It's almost unavoidable. I think, I th I think Jerry can talk more to that. It's his expertise. We've got it baked in the system how much additional warming is likely in the next one to two decades. It's almost unavoidable that we'll um, escape these types of radical increases in the near term. Um, to my read, sugar cropping activities will become virtually impossible in about two generations owing to extreme heat stress, independent of other hazards like we heard today, uh, yesterday. That's all. Based on current practices. Based on current practices. Starting with here. David? Others may, in the group here, may be able to elaborate on this more, but one. Um, Shortcoming of the way that you're able to look at it, I think, is a shortcoming of the of the um, uh, station data that you have, <clears throat> because while you show that the, during the harvesting season, it's less uh, there's less uh, heat stress according to the heat stress index, but the heat stress index does not account for radiant heat, and that is very dramatic in that period of time. So I'm not sure the heat stress index analysis is the right way to look at this question. Though I don't know what is because you don't have the data on gradient heat. Yeah, good point. I, I agree. Yeah, as you saw, the, the um, cloud cover was like 30% yeah. compared to the growing season where it's 90%. So that factor is not part of this calculation. Rick? So, uh, it's very nice analysis. Uh, I want to uh, give the argument for why we thought global warming was playing a role in this epidemic. So, the first thing is uh, you work by Anike Wesseling going back in time suggests that this has been increasing uh, stepwise since the, probably since the 1980s. That this two. Excuse me? 2.4 odds ratio for people in the chamber of the United States. You're on these places like this. I'm sorry. Wait, what? If you compare the sugarcane producing area and that population to the rest of Costa Rica, you're already 2.4 times likely by 76 or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me finish my comment, Jason. Jason. So the, the very first thing is that there does seem to be an increase that uh, is beyond what uh, just reporting, because we, there's better reporting now too, so part of the increase relates to better reporting. And uh, clearly it's linked with, with heat stress and dehydration. I mean, there's just no doubt with all the studies that have been coming out, and now there's experimental models. When we, uh, when we were trying to identify a, a mechanism we found that heat stress, that, that when, with heat stress in particular, you can increase your serum uric acid and you get these uric acid crystals in the urine. It was first reported in the Annals of Internal Medicine by Nacho. Okay? And so it's known that heat stress can do this. And unfortunately, 
humans can't handle uric acid very well because of this mutation. So we, we have to regulate uric acid excretion through the urine because if you had this enzyme that could degrade uric acid, you could regulate it, but we lost that enzyme. And so as a result, we are set where we have to get rid of the uric acid through our urine. And in these people, when they get hot uh, and concentrate their urine, and they're producing uric acid during the day, they're right on the edge. And so what happened was Carlos Roncal, right here, we were doing studies where we were getting samples of urine from sugarcane workers in the morning and in the afternoon after the shift. And we were finding that about 15% of sugarcane workers were having significant urate crystals with concentrations that are known to cause kidney damage. Um, but it was only 15%. And then one, on one day, 100% of them had crystals with uric acid levels of up to 200 milligrams per deciliter, e equivalent to severe acute injury. You know, what you'd see with acute injury with tumor lysis. And so we said, what, why is that? And it turned out it was an early day in May that was the hottest day in El Salvador, or, or, or right across from, I didn't have, the, the thing was in Shenandega, but I didn't have the temperature for Shenandega, but uh, right across, real close, uh, uh, we found that the temperature was the hottest in the day, and it was in early May where they were still uh, uh, harvesting. And 100%, uh, and all seven subjects had this dramatic injury. And that led us to think, well, okay, so we're right, they're right on the edge. Some of them are getting injury all the time with the normal thing, but what happens when the temperature just goes up too much, like a heat wave? And th that precipitated the idea, because although the mean temperatures have not gone up much, these heat waves have been increasing. And so because of that, hypothesis, we, we, we said to ourselves, perhaps that could be a playing a role, that people are going into to the fields with certain amount of fluid thinking that this is going to be another regular day, but if there's a heat wave and you're right on the edge, we're already 15% are developing injury every day, suddenly it's 60% or 50% or 100% that day. Let so me that's comment the, on this? Yeah. Because this, this inspires some further analysis on our end that your comments were very helpful because, as you say, what I looked at here are seasonally averaged or even monthly, <coughs> monthly average data. And we do have daily data for the stations. And so what you're saying is, Marty, right. go back and re-examine the daily records, compute some statistics of heat wave exceedance thresholds yeah. with that frequency. Right. And, and, um, and especially since you're giving a bit of a red line that we, when we cross a certain right. a value, there seems to be this increasing um, right. Yeah. A kidney response or, or serum response that relates to kidney health. Right. So uh, we'll go back and look at the data and see what that tells us. Yeah. Is that, so is the, it? the theory is there's three reasons for the increase. One is better reporting. One is that these heat waves that catch people off guard. And the third one is if they're rehydrating with sugary beverages, which we know can accelerate the injury, if, particularly if they get dehydrated. So we're not saying, uh, you know, that, that original paper we never really meant to say this is uh, a dis just purely a disease of climate change. No, it's a disease of heat stress, which may be exacerbated. Or as well, I guess Jonathan pointed out, climate sensitive. Uh, and, and, and I think we've been a little bit better at stating that later, but I think that first paper, uh, we probably w were too strong. Okay, it inspired us to do what we did. <laughs> Uh, Lee, Lee, and then Jason, and then you, Nikki. Yeah, Marty, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, and um, uh, I mean that very sincerely. Yeah, I was able to follow everything you said. So thanks for dumbing it down for me. Um, oh, that was as high as I can go myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if, if I extrapolate from this, uh, and, and you know, I hear this conversation about that maybe these spikes, these waves, may be the, the early marker, uh, and maybe there's some other factors like radiant heat that may need to be put into the, the equation as well. But what I take from this is that in some ways, even if we can't really prove that Mesoamerican nephropathy is a, is a global warming uh, response, this is probably the right time for us to be prospectively 
watching this workforce very carefully that if they're not that they, they may in fact be the canaries the canaries but you know it's, it's just at the very early point where we would expect to be able to uh, reliably measure this impact would that would you agree with that I would I think at the time in many ways couldn't be better in that regard because I think we are on this cusp of acceleration in the warming in these areas and so I think this is the time to be very much alert there is an interesting thing, and maybe I'm putting too much on Jerry's shoulders, but there has been this curious and unexplained aspect of the way the climate system has been warming. And the curious aspect is probably relevant to uh, uh, Central America and that coastal region adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. And that is that the Eastern Pacific hasn't warmed nearly as much as the rest of the world oceans. That has a regional effect. I don't know what that effect, Jerry, I don't know if you've thought about this, what that regional effect might be. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, so um, oddly, the eastern tropical Pacific has, has lacked a warming signature over the last century to the tune of what we see in the Indian Ocean, for instance. And we're not sure why that is, whether it's transitory. It could mean that there'll be a spike and a recovery if it was just one of these natural decadal variations that occur in the ocean from time to time. And if that's the case, um, the rate of warming in this area may actually see a spike because it may have been, the warming to date may have been inhibited by natural factors that have masked the human factor. And that's one of the concerns that I have in looking at the data that we're seeing. I think we're going to have. To